right, everyone. Hello again. My name is Chris Turner. Here we have a couple distinguished guests with us, the Liberty Conference champions. We have the head coach, Ed Tuberty, and then the captain, Darren Chan. Boys, how are you doing today? Hey, Chris. Fantastic. How are you doing, Chris? Thanks for having us, mate. No, of course. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, first and foremost, uh, I know it happened about two weeks ago from recording today, but uh, Liberty Champs, that's a pretty awesome um, – title to have can you guys explain a little bit about the game how it went down and and exactly what that feeling feels like okay. uh, I mean, it was a game that you know all of us are obviously gearing towards um being in the season we had to go go undefeated you know we worked through that every game game by game and eventually we got to eight and oh we had the liberty conference championship coming up so you know we knew we played bc again it was a hard fought game and uh i think the fourth when we played them and uh, we just knew exactly what we had to do and put our piece together and uh, love that win. Definitely. And it was a hard, hard fought battle. I know uh, you guys pulled away with the score a little bit there, but um, credit to BC, though. Uh, can you kind of, as a captain, can you kind of dive into a little bit about what the boys were feeling before the game, what, uh, how you're feeling during the game, and anything that any adjustments you might have made to really seal that victory? Yeah, I mean, um... You know, I don't think the boys got, you know, I don't think the game got the better of them. I think we, it was just another game in the season. Um, you know, we were pretty focused before the game, during the game. We knew exactly what we had to do, play our system, not just get sucked into theirs. Um, they're a pretty forward, uh, pack-heavy team, uh, led by, you know, Boggs, Connor Robinson. So, you know, we knew that, you know, a bunch of the, the senior members of the team, you know, we gathered together, like, he's not going to score a try this game, shut them down. Um, our, our forwards stepped up big time, shut their forwards down, our backs did our job, scored a bunch of tries, and, you know, we, we played our system to, you know, what we know, and that's, uh, that's what we did. Wonderful. And, and what a great system is in place. I mean, uh, going to you now, Coach, uh, it's pretty hard to go undefeated, not only in conference play, but in complete play during the regular season, and then capping off that undefeated season with the championship. Um, what kind of um, – was there a, a particular scheme that you had for this club or was it um, playing to the best of your strengths? Like wh how does that really look for a coach and, and dealing with that kind of success and building upon it? Uh, we we, we, we kind of look at what we got. I think player personnel. Like we're not actually from our club team, so we got to see what guys come in every year. Mm -hmm. And we kind of trying to play to the best of our, our, our abilities and who we have, what personnel we have. So the system we played this year – was a very kind of um, play to the edges kind of a system. Like, I know it's traditional one three three one you want to call it, but we play a very, like, two-tier offense with a two-pass system with different combinations in the middle. It's a very detailed um, system, you know, that, that we implemented this year. Now, I thought this out of the year, the guys don't have a tough time grasping it, but, I mean, the boys are dedicated. They, they took it on board and we kind of rolled with it and everything was clicking and looked well. And, and the whole point is really just kind of, kind of create mismatches, and that's the whole kind of, like, game plan we're trying to do, you know? And the boys did it. Like, we, we were deep this year. We went down to probably 30, 30-plus 30 guys this year. We had got first-team um, game time this year. So, you know I mean? everyone understands it. And we're starting to develop on top of that. But it's really on a year-to-year basis on who we have and kind of develop schemes and systems off of that. But it's just the finer details. We try and, try and get the better of the other teams when it comes to, to those things, you know. So. No, completely agree 100%. And, of course, it worked out in your favor at the end of the year, you know in that undefeated season and holding that trophy up high, which is great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, so describe a little bit after the game, like how, how did you guys celebrate? I mean, of course this is a PG uh, show here, but I mean, can you like dive in and give us uh, the champions look on things? Uh, no, like we, 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 we just got together, you know, I think uh, we just got together and just congratulate the boys, you know, and, and we, we, we've, I mean, we talk behind the scenes, it kind of takes a village to win a championship. And that's kind of like the mentality we have you know, between the, like the, the parents' involvement, the alumni involvement, the school involvement, to, to the players, to our coaches. You know, it literally takes a village. And you know, afterwards, we said to the guys, enjoy it. You deserved it. You worked hard for it. But you mean, just for the 23 guys here, you're, lucky. you're the lucky ones that are here in the day. But remember, one team, one goal. It takes a village. And the village stepped up. And we're just lucky to get it done this year. We're lucky to, to – because we had a, a couple of tough games this year. And I know you guys talked about it. And because we, we were pretty banged up earlier in the year, especially against like UMass with a few guys out and we scraped through that one. Right. And Fairfield with a few guys out again, we scraped through that one, you know. And it's really near the end of the year we started getting healthy. Um, and, and then we started really kind of getting back to, to mean, how we want to play, um, which is kind of good. But it takes a village, as, as you know, all the top teams know that. 
you, you can't depend on 23 guys. Someone goes down, it's next man mentality. So, um, so the whole team, everyone stepped up. And it was, I mean, it felt good. It was a great, great day, great day for the club as a whole. So we're all very, very happy. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, Darren, can I, if I, I could uh, kind of go to you on this one, from the actual school perception of the club and everything, and I mean, how big is rugby within Northeastern? How much is it celebrated as a club? And then after this win, was the entire campus incredibly juiced about it? Or, I mean, kind of give us a little bit of detail about that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, I live with like six or seven of the rugby guys right now, and it's mostly built up of the senior members, and we've worked really hard over the past few years to, you know, build the culture around campus, around rugby. Um, you know, our athletics program, our, our club sports program has done a great job you know, building rugby up in our school. Um, and you're really prioritizing us as a top team in the school. Um, but, you know, it's funny here, you know, we, we have, you know, events every week and hear people buzzing about it, talking about it, how, you know, rugby's doing something or, you know, you know and everyone knows, you know, <clears throat> rugby at this point. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a good feeling to, to have that around campus right now. Definitely, man. And that, that's such, that should be such a cool feeling, um, just walking around, you know, having that title. <laughs> essentially, like that metaphorical WWE belt around you, just like, yeah, we're champs. What's up? Like, <laughs> and everyone actually giving you that credit, which is like, you know, a testament to the club. But that's awesome. Um, so maybe this might be a question for both of you, but I know a lot of other clubs have diverse uh, answers on this one. But how do you, A, recruit, and then, B, maintain the quality level of play that you desire to have in a club? Sure, I'll take this one. Um, the recruitment pieces, uh, we, we do a lot of work behind the scenes. So we have like um, international, a lot of international kids coming in. But to get into our Eastern Chris is, is, is very hard. It's very hard to get in and, and there's such academic standards held. Um, like we, we have a couple of kids like uh, from certain high schools that we're looking at right now. We've constantly been in touch with them for, I've been in touch with them for a year or two. Darren has been in touch with them. Parents kind of guiding them on the process, but it's never a guarantee. Um, so it's usually we might, if we have like say 15 kids, it's usually we might get one or two in who actually kind of meet the academic standards. So we don't really do um, recruitment where we can cherry pick that particular player. We just kind of help guide the kids on getting in and, and if they get in, create the bonus. But it's really the international contingent that are kind of like coming in and with the, with the IQ and um, with the background of rugby and they come in and to kind of evolve and kind of help raise the standard. And that's what we kind of like geared towards. We have a lot of international kids that come in. Um, again, not all of them play rugby. Um, but we do get like one or two every year to come in and kind of help solidify certain positions that we're, we're weak at or we're, or we're struggling with or right. taking through up a certain gap that we're trying to do. But there's not a whole lot of recruitment that we do, you know. Um, and then for the, for the rugby standard itself, it's just – it comes down like we, we, we have a great coaching staff, you know. I got, I got a bunch of other coaches like Alex Mikio, He's Boston Irish Wolfhounds legend. great forwards coach. You got Diego who's involved the Free Jacks. You got Chris Frazier. I don't know if you know him. He's involved with OTC with Mike mm -hmm. or Friday and the Free Jacks. And then you got Dave Wedge, alumni, and Troy Strength Expert. We have a big coaching staff. And we all complement each other. And we all bounce ideas off each other. And it kind of works where, like, where we come in, we have a first 15, second 15 development squad. That's how we kind of run things. Oh. And with the development squad, with the new guys coming in, they learn the basics, get up to speed, and about midway through the season, they come up and they join up with the, the, the B side slash A side. And we kind of mix and match. And that's what we kind of like get the standard going and kind of get guys implemented as quick as possible. But without the coaches, like I said, we won't be able to do that. And that's how we kind of we run with the recruitment piece to the player personnel. Because we have a big, like, I think this year we had 68 guys, I think, started the season. So we had a massive, like, player pool. But unfortunately, they don't always stay there. They always dip down. You end up with, like, 45, 50 guys you have, and that's what you maintain. Um, but we have a de decent player pool we kind of pull from. And, and it's just getting younger guys up to speed as quick as possible. Um, Mm -hmm. that's why we kind of work, the, work within our, 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 our ranks, you know, so um, but again, it goes down to the, I mean, the senior leadership and, and the other coaches really stepping up and helping, helping, helping us out, and like I said, we all complement each other, so it works really, really well Definitely, and that's a complete testament to the coaching staff of, you know, what you had kind of dipped in on earlier about it takes an entire village to, yeah. you know, raise this team and to have that culture and sustain that and, and really build upon it Absolutely. so Kudos to the Northeastern coaching staff, everyone that was mentioned there. That is um, absolutely tremendous to have that a part of your club, and hopefully others can truly learn from that. Um, but anyway, going on to uh, – and I know we had briefly discussed before the podcast began about Coach. You said you were from Ireland originally. Yeah, that's does, right. Does that help with that international connection, bringing those guys over, or is it just pure coincidence that you have a big international influence into the club? Uh, a bit of both. 
bit of both, you know. I I I played a pretty pretty high standard. I thought back home, you know. Um, uh, I played in the semi pros in Ireland. I was involved with the Munster Academy going through and I had contracts and utterly stuff. So I had connections over there, mm-hmm. um, which kind of helps out a lot. But it 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 just gives you a bond, really. You know, like we've a we've a, a couple of Irish guys. So like Norwich University have certain uh, sister programs. So they have universities such as like DCU in Dublin, for example, where there's certain. Um, students go over there and students come in here and we've been looking enough last like, couple of years we have one one guy come in and played lance on the semi-pro ranks uh, jim o'shea and um, so he's a kid he came in he was a stud for a while and then this year we had a ga player and i don't know if you're familiar with the ga and the Gaelic football yes uh, yeah. uh very briefly yeah very briefly yeah. so so the skill set for these kids so we had a kid last year he's actually played ga at a really high level Roland jones and his skill set transferred right over to robbie perfectly and I, i'm very familiar with it because i played it myself right uh, and this year, with another kid come over through the DCU program, Jack Bambrick, he actually played in the center in the yellow boots. Um, and he, had a, he had a great game as well, a great season. But the skill set comes over where they pick up, there's natural athletes. They're hybrids, I call them, you know. Um, so that connection as well with me being an international person, an immigrant, if you want to call it. So we have that bond, it definitely helps, you know, um, kind of solidify and get the guys invested in the program a lot quicker than maybe in previous years. But um, it definitely helps. It definitely helps. For sure, for sure. And, and Darren, if you don't mind if I go over to you on this one, um, what's that like playing with not only international players, having a different perspective of the game, and also having these, uh, these hybrids, as what you said, Coach, uh, playing with you? How is that all kind of mixed within the melting pot of Northeastern? I mean, it, it all really just kind of works. Um, Northeastern's a pretty, you know, it's, it's an international school. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we got guys from London, Ireland, you know, Asia, Singapore, Australia, know, Australia, over, Australia years, yeah. over the years coming through. So, you know, it's something that a lot of us are really used to at this point. Um, you know, and it's, it, they're all great lads. It's not like they come in and say like, oh, like this is my spot. You know, everyone works for their spot. And, you know, it, it just kind of raises the level. It, 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 um, it really just comes together really well. It works out. Definitely. And, and how does that really help in your advantage against your other Liberty and crossover opponents? I mean, do they have the similar um, international presence that you guys do, or is it more or less um, through the coaching staff that helps you get over those, uh, those obstacles of, of challenges? Um, I, I can't speak to what, uh, you know, other, you know, I don't know how, what the international presence about BC is, but I think it's more just about, you know, the international, you know, Northeastern is just an international school. There are a lot of connections out there. You have the NUN programs that, you know, a lot of kids and the exchange programs that go abroad and all that kind of thing. So, you know, we, we do have that, you know, talent pool that comes in and out. Um, but it, it's hit and miss though. It is hit and miss, I have yeah. to say, you know, it's like some years are better than other years. Like last year we had one kid come in and that was it. Whereas the year before that, when we had the first time the feeder season, we had three or four kids come in. It really helped. Um, especially, you mean, they come in to plug holes, they understand the game, they understand the system that, you mean, our seven coaches are trying to do. Um, you know, but it is really hit and miss uh, when it comes to that, you know, because it is, it's literally you turn up on the first day of the year, you know, the kind of like 30 guys you have from the previous year, and they're like, all right, who's showing, who's showing up this year? And you're going to see who they are, and you're going to kick on from there. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, and, and it's not like we, we rely on those guys either. You know, it just raises the bar. You know, I'd say 80% of our team is local. Um, you know, me, like myself, and another senior manager from, you know, from Belmont, uh, Belmont High, right around the corner and, uh, from Boston. You know, we got guys from Connecticut, New Hampshire, and, you know, that, that's just, you know, our recruiting around campus as well as international. It's just kind of, you know, it speaks to our coaching staff as well, but um, it's just, you know, we, we work with the resources we have, and it, it all comes together. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And uh, again, kudos to the Northeastern Club for, for taking all that into consideration and continuing to build on that success. And coach, you had, you had men, uh, mentioned previously uh, another undefeated season. I'm seeing a trend here um, within the club. <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, we, we, we try. It, it, every year is different, Chris. You know, like, like I said, we've had two in the last three years. And the first year Liberty went undefeated. And we played Cortland in final and won. Uh, last year we went six and two. And then this year, uh, nine and oh, right? Nine and oh. Um, it's 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 every year is different, you know. Like when you're a club, it's we all do behind the scenes. So we work we work every day. We're constantly tipping away. It's, it's trying to stabilize the club and kind of keep it as competitive as possible. But with you know club rugby, if you're not a varsity program, you're you're waiting for that dip, and that rebuild it, that rebuild year. And uh, we've been lucky enough the last couple of years we've had, haven't had it, and uh, we've had the players come in, step up, take over, and to mean increase their IQ, increase decision making, their skill set, and kind of help the club kind of keep building and keep the momentum going. But that's the, that's the thing with club, club rugby, you know. Um, 
especially when you're playing the varsity against the varsity teams, is a lot of the club teams do dip. They do have that rebuild year, whether it's every four years, every three years, whatever it is. Right. We just, like I said, we've just been lucky enough to stabilize it for right now. And hopefully we just keep going, keep riding the wave and, and keep the players coming in and kind of keep the consistency um, throughout the club. And that's the, that's the goal, you know? Right. And consistency is the key in there. And that, that does ring true. Um, so I guess this is a question for potentially both of you, but more or less for Darren. Um, maybe for those of uh, the audience or um, rugby fans out there who aren't really privy to Liberty Conference uh, level and style of play, uh, can you maybe dive into a little bit about your opponents, um, the quality of play, and anything else uh, regarding that? Uh, I mean, you know, it's in, the Liberty Conference is interesting because, you know, it's made up of three subdivisions. And I think it's one of the biggest, you know, divisions out there. So, you know, you have a lot of diversity in terms of what kind of, like, you know, player quality, as you said, like, out there. So you got top teams like BC, UMass, um, Fordham from the other divisions, Iona, um, you know, all these top teams. And you got, you know, other teams that are, you know, a little lower. And it all kind of bounces out. And I think, you know, it, um, I mean, the, st the standard is there. You know, you got some top teams mixed in there that, you know, do represent the Liberty pretty well. Right. And you're right. It is a, the biggest conference in mm -hmm. the division. I think um, if my math serves me correctly, something like 16 teams within those three subdivisions or subconferences, and you will. Yeah. And it just seems like a complete bloodbath at the end of the year of like scraping by to get to the top of the yeah. table. And it seems like a complete challenge every single year. Um, I mean, yeah. maybe dive in a little bit of that uh, com competition towards, you know, those championship games too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool to, you know, track the results of each game, each division. Um, you know, obviously each team is looking to the other, bit, other divisions to see, you know, how they're doing. And it's cool to see how it shakes up at the end. You know, you got BC and us uh, being from the same division, but then you have, you know, Cuse and AIC playing cross division, see how that result shakes up. So, um, you know, it's cool to see how each division kind of shakes up at the end. Definitely, definitely. And I know it's a little bit tough with, um, you know, certain divisions playing in different times of the year and everything. But, hey, that kudos again to the Northeastern Club for finishing with an outstanding 9-0 record. Um, and, again, like you, in, you mentioned those quality players and teams where, like, you guys snuck by essentially UMass and then, like, had a bunch of other close games where it's like, you're not blowing these teams out of the water per se. No, it's no. very competitive games. Yeah, like the, the standard of conference, I have to say, is uh, it's ex extremely high. You know, I think there's like if you look at like throughout the conference, like Fairfield are a fantastic team, well coached by Austin and Mark down there, and they're hard. I, I I thought that was one of the hardest games we had this year. I thought mm -hmm. Fairfield it was a that was a brutal game, phys just physical and um, very physical game. You know, BC was another great battle we had back and forth um, this year as well. Again, another close game until the end. Mm -hmm. UMass, UMass came down to the down to the wire out there in, out there in uh, Western uh, Massachusetts. You know, we travel out there now and a half. And Phil, Phil's another great coach out there. He did I mean they're, they're just a team that do the fundamentals great and they really like came out to the wire and we just lucky we got the win on the day. Um, and then to I mean toss toss another up and coming team. They had a strong year this year on the TC Tom Clark. Um, and then Warren down there in Rhode Island, like they're up and down. UConn, UConn had a bit of a tough year this year, but UConn been pretty solid last couple of years under uh, Bob Morello. Um, and they're, they're another fantastic program. I expect them to bounce back quickly next year. I know that they, I think they're a real tough year this year, but Bob, Bob's a good coach, smart guy. And, I mean, they got good resources on there, so I expect them to bounce back. But then the follow over to the other conference, like four of them are very competitive. And we played them in, in New York, and that was, that was a tough game for us. We went up there, and like they, were, they were winning for a while, and we just came back in the second half and looking to get in. Hey, I see another tough opponent. I mean, Iona, we, we, we haven't came across Iona yet. Do you know what I mean? It is what it is. But, um, and then Syracuse up there in Buffalo, they've been kind of running right up there in the, the, the upper, new, upper state kind of conference. So if you look as a whole, it's great for us. It's a Chris. You know, I think having, having all those teams, all those major colleges in one conference under one roof um, just shows how strong John Robbie's grown and how, how, how big it's becoming at the grassroots levels and going right to collegiate level. And you're starting to see the benefits in the MLO, MLR level, you know. Um, so I think right there in the middle of collegiate with Liberty Conference, I think it's one of the forefronts and uh, kind of leading the charge in, in how maybe the other conferences maybe you should have a look at coming together and creating a bigger conference. Uh, and really kind of stepping up the, the standard and kind of solidifying the player pool because that's what it really is. You're solidifying the player pool, especially for the major professional teams. So we'll see what happens over the next couple of years with that. But it's exciting. I think Liberty Conference is in a great place. It's very exciting. And I'm mean, looking forward to seeing what happens next year as well. I couldn't agree with you more, Coach. Again, rugby in the States is on the up. 
and especially the collegiate level. And it's really exciting to see teams like yourself thrive for uh, continuous years of that. I appreciate it. Um, so, um, Darren, if you don't mind me uh, drawing the attention toward yourself, um, what year are you? Um, are you a junior, senior? Are you graduating? I'm, I'm senior. I'm a fifth year senior graduating this year. Senior to graduate. Yeah, knock on wood, barring nothing goes wrong. But no. Yeah, hopefully. I know how that goes. <laughs> this is process and doing all the mentors. Anyway, and, and coach, I know you probably don't want to be talking about the eventual leaving of, of your yeah. captain here. But, Darren, if you don't mind, what, what's next on the play for you, man? Uh, you, you know, everything's kind of up in the air right now. Um, you know, we got a bunch of academies going around, you know, you have the free jack. So it, 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 we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out when it, when it comes. So definitely level or uh, rugby at the next level. Is that what your eyes are on? That, that, that's the goal. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. Okay, man. Okay. Well, best of luck to you. <laughs> Cross your fingers for you. Maybe. And uh, I mean, hey, if you got video of yourself, I'll do my best to get that out <laughs> in, uh, to the MLR teams if we can. But uh, anyway, and, and coach, um, Really briefly, I guess, I, I know we dipped a little bit into it of like the, the cycle of players and, you know, how college works and graduating yeah. and new people coming in. Um, <laughs> can you kind of just dive in a little bit of the coaching lifestyle, how tough it is to lose players like, like Darren over here and, and really what it takes to, to build up those freshmen and sophomores or those hybrids uh, athletes who never played the game and, and bringing them to that quality level that you aspire to? It's it's a it's a grind. Like it, it's it takes it takes a lot. You know, we, you 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 try and plan for it as much as possible. We have uh, one or two kids, kind of hopefully fighting for uh, for Darren spot come next year. You know, coming true freshmen, um, and we kind of been prepping them all year. They've been working alongside Darren, Shadow and Darren. They got some game time with the first side this year as well, um, especially with development squad as well. Like a lot of players um, came in. Like one player, for example, came through two years ago. Stands out to me, Alex Parasiak. Uh, he actually played in Brady against BC. Um, and he's a standout. I remember talking to JD, JD Stevenson and Chris and them, and he, they were like taking notes of this kid. And he only started playing two years ago as a wrestler, came in, didn't know a thing about rugby, and just really just picked the game up quickly and listened, was coachable. Uh, and that's what we try and do. You know, we try and come in and, and, and with the development squad, get all the, the fundamentals down and the main, the main points. And then obviously they come up to us and we kind of go through the, the real detail stuff and kind of get them up to speed and how we want to run a system, how they should play. Um, and then come in, get the comms off, the IQ off, decision making off. But that's really what it comes down to is the difference. I feel like with Robbie over here in comparison to some of the like European countries, it really comes down to decision making and the IQ. You know, and I, th I think the quicker we do that at the grassroots levels, the quicker it's going to raise the standard. Um, and, you know, for the collegial teams, the money, MLR teams, or the national team. But it's just that IQ decision making, making the right decision at the right time. And, and that's really what the fundamentals that we try and do at the collegiate level when the kids come to us. So. And the boys are very coachable. They listen, and we we have a solid culture. There's no when the boys come for two or two hour training session three times a week. They listen. They come in. They get on with it. They listen. They do. They say. They jump. Do you know, we just get on with what we need to do, and they take it on board and develop that into the next day, uh, next session, and kind of kick on from there. So it's a very it's a very uh very unique system, but to me it's a grind. But we I enjoy it. The coaches enjoy it. So we'll keep tipping away for another while. Definitely. And, and I know I don't want to give you guys too many compliments. Again, kudos to uh, the coach and staff and how you guys really approach the game and really see the bigger picture of things. Um, anyway, so I know we have a few more minutes here, boys. And I know you got a lot more things to do throughout your day. You're prepping for holidays and everything like that. But uh, we got a couple more um, off the cuff, funny questions for you to just kind of see a little bit more about your rugby experience, your lifestyle and everything like that. Obviously, we won't go too personal. But uh, so we'll start with Darren. So Darren, what kind of a sock wearer are you during games? Are you, you wear them high, you wear them low, no socks. What, what's your look? I got the high socks rolled down. Kind of the, uh, you know, I used to be the high socks for 15s, low socks for 7s. Uh, kind of, <laughs> oh, there's a switch up. There's, yeah, there's, uh, a, there's, there's a different uh, way the games uh, look, huh? To be, uh, the roll down look for, uh, for both seasons now. Okay, so what what made the change? Was it just like uh, want to show off the calves a little bit more, or was yeah. it more aerodynamic? <laughs> it's, 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 it's the cows, showing the cows off, not the calves. The cows. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we call them the upside down horseshoes, you know. <laughs> 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 funny. Well, I, I, I'm gonna direct that right back to you, Coach. So uh, in your playing days, uh, how how'd you uh, wear your sock game? Oh, all the way up. All the way up. Yeah. 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 All the way up. I wouldn't, uh, no question. I wouldn't, <laughs> all the way up. I'm not like this guy right here. Can't do that. Yeah, yeah. You got the old school meeting the new school here. But, there you, you know, go. It's always just interesting to see how people, um, you know, wear, wear them. But I was always the up guy, and I always even put a little bit of electrical tape at the top. Yeah. Of the oh, I had to. I had to. Yeah, I had to. I couldn't have it come down. I don't, it was just, for me, it was a comfort thing. 
it was just a, for comfort. I couldn't wear it down. I uh, just didn't feel comfortable, so I was warm high. Yeah, definitely. Get also, like, muddy Ireland winners too. You you want as much uh, much sock as you can. Yes, that's true. That's true. Especially in the rainy rainy days and the muddy days we play. My lord. Seriously. Um. All right. Next question though, Darren. Um, and this will also be the same questions for both of you as well. So coach, I'm going to give you a little bit more time, uh, Darren. So if you not talking about specific players of your teammates, but positions, if you, if the game changed to 14s tomorrow, what position would you take out and why? 14s. I don't know what what, what I take out. Um, (laughs) In our, just in general, just a general, just, yeah, general just, game. Just in general. Do you want to answer it? Do you want to think about it? Yeah, yeah you too, you too. Uh, <laughs> no worries. I'll take out a back row player. A back row? Yeah. Because yeah. you, 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 you still keep it balanced. <laughs> you know, you, just, but you play without the eight man, the two flankers. You still have a solid back line. So you still kind of, I mean, keep the, the space in throughout the field. So if you have to do it, that's what I would do. Yeah. Smart. Okay. Okay. Darren, do you, do you have a rebuttal or is it kind of, yeah? No, I was going to say uh, someone out of the pack or maybe a center, you know, um, someone where you can kind of balance it out. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. No, I've, I, it's, it's interesting, too, because I've heard back row once before. Haven't heard center yet. That would definitely open up the game and create a lot of trouble for that fullback. Terrible. Trying to get no, that's <laughs> terrible. It's like there'd be no fullback, even the line lock. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's terrible. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, it's no, good thing no, I'm no, everyone's got opinions, all right? Everyone's got opinions. But uh, no, too. thank you for answering that, boys. Um, so for the next one, I guess, would be uh, like magic wand in your hand situation. If you had to change a rule, which rule would you change? Uh, it, it's tough because, you know, a lot of rules nowadays are you're so geared towards player safety. And, uh, um, you know, it's tough to kind of pound on those. Um, maybe, you know, like supporting yourself in the rock, you know, you see that so, you know, so up in the air and the pros and, you know, people just come in flying in. I just kind of feel like sometimes it's called a little too early. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a loaded question. Okay. Okay. Coach, any, any answer? Uh, how the breakdown is run. I think it's so subjective out there with all the, the referees. Everyone has their own interpretation, no matter what referee course you go through. Mm. Uh, even myself, I mean, I, I, I think I'm pretty experienced playing and, and coaching at this stage, and I still scratch my head around the breakdown and how, and how the referees interpret it. So I guess uh, just how the breakdown is refereed. I just, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to sit down at maybe a referee clinic someday and kind of like really sit there and grill them exactly what they're all thinking and see if they're thinking the same thing and they're drawing the same page. But definitely... It scratches my head a lot over here, but that's not something wrong that I look at. Definitely. Yeah. That's a good answer. Thank you for that, Coach. Um, so we got the last, last question here, guys. Um, so, Darren, I know I might be putting a spot here, but as soon as the game's over, let's just say, you know, this couple weekends ago, championship game or during the regular season, um, muddy game, you know, you're, you're absolutely drenched. Everything smells. Are you go home and put everything in the corner kind of a guy or immediately into the laundry? Uh, I'm laundry guy. I, I, I got to get that out and just, you know, make sure it's all clean. I'm, I'm, I'm a big laundry guy. Nice. Mom appreciate <laughs> that answer too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's not telling the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm BT please. No, he's lying. <laughs> that's amazing. Depends on the day. Uh, depends on the day, right? Yeah. yeah like, that, that's a better yeah. answer. At least you tell the truth now. Give, give it the sniff, like, yeah, there you go. Uh, you can go another day. Uh, you can go another day. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm not judging. I've done that a few times. <laughs> no worries. No worries. No worries. Anyway, well, um, I know we're, we're gearing toward the end here of our little chat, but um, before I, I, I sign us off here, um, I'm going to make sure to put down at the bottom uh, how to get in touch with the club um, through the website, through the social media channels, yep, that'd be um, great. all that Thank stuff. You. So if anyone wants to learn more about the academic standards of Northeastern, what it really takes to get into school, and then once they do, what happens in joining the rugby club? So I'll make sure to put that all down, down or at the bottom of the screen. And then before, um, I'm going to give you both a little bit of time to uh, have the table here to give out anyone out there a shout out and uh, give a little bit of praise uh, for anyone who deserves it. Do you want me to take this one as well? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just want to thank everyone at Northeastern University, uh, especially at the close sports, ADs. And Nick Drew, Evan Chelsea helping us out. The alumni constantly supporting us. Families of all the players constantly supporting us. 
um, the coaching staff and um, who's always been there kind of helping out and especially the players who really put in the, the hard work throughout the year you know I appreciate the village stepping up and we've had a good season so I can't thank everyone enough and I gotta say I gotta thank my own family as well for leaving me leave the house you know my wife and the kids so I appreciate that as well definitely definitely thank you Gary yeah, I mean, for sure, you know, thank, thank, thank my family and thank, all, you know, all the, uh, you know, the, the alumni, the Northeastern alumni have been a huge part in uh, our success as well. So, I yeah, thank the alumni, thank uh, Club Sports and Northeast University for giving us that recognition. And um, especially to the guys that, you know, have been putting the work in behind the scenes that don't necessarily get the spotlight. Um, thank those guys as well. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Your words, your thoughts, everything in between. Yeah, Chris. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you guys have on or have you guys on again. Um, Darren might be another level, my man. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But uh, coach, he should coach be. again, great talk with y'all. And um, everyone out there, thank you for joining in, tuning in, and, uh, you know, help cheer on the Northeastern Huskies. Uh, next round up. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Chris. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Really appreciate Cheers, it. Bye. All right. There's a line out taken by the Mad Dogs. They are leading 19-5, but one of their try scorers. That's Lowell Haska. Lowell Haska. There you go. There he is. Putting pressure right in. There. And there's He's Chan, the you. captain, and he is in. Oh, quick tap. Here's Connor Robinson, leading try scorer for Boston College. But he's met sharply by four, three, and four. The ball here, coach. There's number five. Lowell Haska, oh. and he charges in for the try, right under the. Well, the wind itself isn't the isn't the worst part. It's just kind of the overlying cold that is a consistent presence over the field. However, with the players on the on the field consistently moving around, I don't foresee that being a big problem. Well, they are they are moving around in in great fashion down there as Northeastern with a big run and a rumble and a try. Wow.